What do I see on my screen? What is what is my eye spy? What do I spy with my little eye on the screen here? I see deuterium helium three fusion. So right off the bat here, I can tell he's going to start talking about a neutronic fusion. I can see it right here on the screen. He's showing the various curves here for the cross sections. These are the cross section curves for the optimal temperatures that you want to run each individual fusion fuel at. It all relies on taking some uh, gas, right? Uh, and heating it up so that two nuclei can overcome their mutual repulsion, overcome the Coulomb barrier and fuse. And you know, in this particular case, for example, deuterium plus tritium, you get back, you get out an, an alpha particle, so helium plus a neutron. And the reason this this reaction, this fusion reaction in particular, is the one that we most often consider has to do with cross section and the shape of the cross section as a function of energy. And you know, if you think that it's difficult to heat something to very high temperatures, what you seek is the reaction that's going to maximize cross section at the smallest possible temperature. Right. So you could be doing it with helium three, or you could be doing it with deuterium deuterium, but the the reaction that has the most the most um, the highest cross section at the lowest temperature happens to be deuterium tritium. And so that's why we sort of do it. And the whole idea is very, very simple. You know, this reaction produces an alpha particle with 3.5 MeV energy. It produces a neutron with 14 MeV uh, energy. The neutron, of course, is not, doesn't respond to electric fields or magnetic fields. So it comes out and you use it presumably to activate some sort of heat cycle. And the helium stays confined and you hope to use the energy from the helium to keep your plasma hot. So it's self- so there you go. He just explained the basis for hot fusion right there. First thing he says is, why are we going through deuterium tritium when we have a neutronic fusion? Well, temperature is way lower. Requires way lower temperature. And right here, he's actually explaining magnetic confinement fusion. There is a slight difference between magnetic confinement fusion and inertial confinement fusion, though they both have same similar principles. So magnetic confinement fusion, we're trying to force these two particles together to overcome this Coulomb barrier that they, they want to repel each other, but we want to force them to come together. So <clears throat> what he's saying here is that we need this high temperature. We need this high. I would also, I wouldn't really call it temperature. I think a better way to describe is we need this higher energy level. Temperature heat is energy. They're all just energy. So for me, I think the, the secret we're going to find is there's non-radiative energy from the vacuum of space-time that can be used to either lower the Coulomb barrier or used in effect to cause attraction between our particles that can allow for that cross-section we're seeing here to happen at much lower temperatures. So for those of you wondering... How does cold fusion functionally play into the hot fusion science? This is it right here. What cold fusion is saying is that we don't need these high temperatures to achieve fusion. And that, in my opinion, the theory that covers cold fusion the best is resonance, the resonance model. If I vibrate two molecules right next to each other, Right. Imagine two molecules are right next to each other, locked in place, and I start vibrating them. In theory, this might be able to overcome the Coulomb barrier without this huge temperature. And this would be abusing general relativity. Relativistic effects are being abused in this situation because from the perspective of the things vibrating, Imagine seeing something moving away from you at super high speed and coming back at you at super high speed. This is called a relativistic effect. And so we can abuse these relativistic effects even on these small scales. What we're going to find out from this presentation is that these relativistic effects are discounted. When it comes to plasma fusion, when it comes to hot fusion, they completely discount these relativistic effects. They say that we are doing our plasma science much lower than the speed of light. Therefore, those relativistic effects don't apply and don't matter. Well, I mean, that's essentially like taking away half the recipe and then wondering why your pizza didn't come out right. <laughs> like, hey, those, 
The pizza sauce doesn't matter, chat. Don't worry about the tomato sauce. We don't need any of that. Just put some cheese on some bread. Maybe throw a couple slices of pepperoni on there. Put it in the oven. Okay, let's learn about... This is not easy to confusion. do. Um, so ask yourself, how do I confine a gas of electrons and ions? When you try to put it in some container, let's say it's some sort of cylinder. And of course, you know, if you use random is in random direct, right? So they'll there and eventually hit the walls of your device and recombine there and you're out of plasma. So one way to do it is just say, well, let me have a magnetic field threading, threading a cylinder. And I know that if I do that, the particles can move freely along the magnetic field, but perpendicular to the magnetic field, they have to go in, in larger gyrations. And so they're confined, at least perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, this is huge, guys. This this is this is absolutely happening in the orbs and the MH370 videos. You ask yourself, number one, how do you confine the particles? That answer is simple. Magnetic fields. We'll get the particles confined by the magnetic fields themselves because the particles will not be able to fight against the magnetic field lines. If my magnetic field line is curving like this, my particle can't move perpendicular. In fact, my particle can't move in any direction other than along the magnetic field line. It must follow the magnetic field line. That's what this image is showing right here. This image is showing that we can confine the particles by manipulating our magnetic fields, and then the particles will naturally follow them. And what does that mean? That means we no longer need a cage. <laughs> we don't need a metal cage for our fusion reactor anymore. This is the beginning, the precursor towards an exotic vacuum object. Because once you've understood that the magnetic fields themselves can be the confinement of the plasma, your next logical question would be, why do I need anything inside my plasma ball at all? Can't I just spin up like a smoke ring of plasma and just have it go? Yeah, you can. And the stability will be much longer than what classical physics will predict. But if you want a plasma ball, there's a permanent plasma ball. One that can be controlled actively you're gonna need at least some equipment on the inside of it. Magnetic confinement is all about using the magnetic fields themselves. And look how he's got the electrons here corkscrewing around, right? When we think of the motion of the electrons, we shouldn't think of it as a straight line. They're corkscrewing around in a vortex motion. What is large can be made small, scale and variance. Truly, the more I've researched the physics, the more convinced I am that scale invariance is the answer. When we look at the atoms, they are gonna look like the solar system. If I want them also to be confined along the magnetic field, all I have to do is turn the cylinder into a donut, right? Of course. And that's the whole idea behind uh, sort of the most advanced schemes in magnetic confinement fusion. And we call this a tokamak. Here's the most recent uh, conception of one in a model that's, that MIT is proposing here called Spark. You're seeing a cross section, of course. This thing is a bridal chamber. That's been cut here in the drawing so that you can see the, the, the glow of the plasma inside. This is just a cartoon, of course. This is not a real experiment. We're building it now, hoping to have it working in 2025. Let me go back to this cross section here, and let me call your attention to this number, 100 keV. Okay. 100 keV is around 100, 100 million degrees centigrade. So that's hotter than the surface of the sun. The sun doesn't have to worry about this, but we do because we want to maximize fusion reactions. And so we want to operate at very high temperatures. And so that means that on this drawing, there's going to be a plasma here, which at its center is sort of at, you know, maybe 20 keV, okay? So 100 million degrees Celsius. This is important. But over here, well, you know, there's going to be a material surface here, right? And materials are going to be at room temperature. So the temperature gradient, from here to here is probably the largest temperature gradient in the entire solar system. <laughs> wow. When he said that, and I listened to this, I went, holy crap. I just kept thinking about the orbs in the MH370 videos. Realize the orbs in the MH370 videos are fusion reactors. That means at the center of those orbs that we are looking at extremely high temperatures, even in cold fusion, those temperatures are still going to be really, really, really hot. 
What that means is, just like you said right there, the temperature gradient, the gradient is the difference in temperature between the center of the orb where the fusion's happening and the edge of the orb where we can see the field in the videos. We can see the field of the edge of the orb. That's the highest temperature gradient in the entire solar system. The difference between the temperature at the center of that orb and the edge of that orb is a bigger temperature gradient than anywhere in the entire solar system, even the sun itself. How insane is that? How cool is that, though, too, at the same time? And now we look at it and we go, man, that heat signature of those orbs is probably like a fingerprint that basically says exactly who made that. Because however they design that structure on the inside of that plasma orb is literally producing that exact configuration with the bubble, with the like, you know, orange slice heat signature in it, with the axial jets of the reverse field configuration. Like somebody is probably like sweating bullets because they're like, someone's going to figure out that I'm the person that made that, <laughs> you know? Woo. Oh, boy. It goes from 100 million degrees Celsius to basically, you know, 30 Celsius, okay? And this distance, this is a person. So this distance is about one meter, if that. Now, as physics students, you probably know that there's one thing that nature does not like, and that's gradients. Nature doesn't like density gradients, uh, rayleigh taylor instability. Nature doesn't like... Oh, and so I'm going to skip. I'm going to summarize his next point and then go ahead of here because he says, he makes a great point. He says, nature doesn't like gradients. So this is actually a huge problem in plasma because if I have a really high temperature over here and a really low temperature over here, the hot wants to flow to the cold. Simple thermodynamics. So now if I'm modeling my plasma, now we have a problem because now we have to take into account this thermal gradient and how that thermal gradient is going to move the plasma around just like a lava lamp. You heat up your lava lamp and now the plasma starts to flow all around, right? So now we have to take that into account as well. But what would be the answer for that? Isn't the answer for that so simple? The answer is we want lower temperatures. The lower the temperature that you can get that to be, the less you have to worry about the gradient. If there's a huge gradient, then that's a bigger issue for instability. So one answer would be, well, just try to find a way to get to lower temperatures and make your fusion happen, and then you have less of a gradient. There might be another answer, though, here. Hmm. What's he about to say here? And these two turbulences happening at different scales talk to each other and inform each other. And you can see it here. You see, So these big blobs that you see are turbulence on the ion scales. But there's fine striations on top of each one of these blobs, and that's turbulence at the electron scales. And the fact that these two turbulences talk to each other means that you, if you want to get this right, you have to simulate all of these scales simultaneously. So to give you an example, for those of you who are interested in computational details, this simulation, this one simulation, the cost of it was 18 million CPU hours. So this simulation that you're watching, 18 million CPU hours to do just this simulation where you're watching. It looks like, looks like my fire, my uh, fake electric fireplace I've got over here. <laughs> looks like that. And this is what they're measuring. They're measuring this thermal gradient plus the electric conductivity in this plasma. And they're trying to figure out how the plasma is going to move around. That's what they're doing. And so you're realizing now as well, what else are we realizing? There is a direct connection between this plasma research and supercomputers. Because you need supercomputers to model this plasma research. So if somebody has already got super advanced a neutronic fusion orbs it means they also have supercomputers that go along with it because they need the supercomputers at a minimum to model the simulations when they were developing them but they probably also need the supercomputers to control the plasma in real time as well to control it in real time to do the math that's necessary to control the instabilities that means that if you have 18 million cpus you'd run them all in parallel for one hour to get this, okay? That's not how it's done. This is run on tens of thousands of processors simultaneously, so parallel computing, right, at state of the art then, and leads to this incredibly complex scenario that we then sort of mine for data and try to make better sense of. Now, it's not just 
turbulent, uh, tokamak plasmas that are turbulent, space and astrophysical plasmas are almost invariably in a state of turbulence themselves, even if the reason for that turbulence tends to be different from just temperature gradients. And so this beautiful illustration that you can see in my virtual background is a simulation of turbulence done by my former student, uh, Janade in, in Chingolo, of turbulence in an accretion disk. Okay, pop quiz, hot shot. Pop quiz, hot shot. If you don't know what movie that's from, get out right now, chat. Get out. If you don't know about Keanu Reeves, get out. Pop quiz, hot shot. How do you battle against these turbulent instabilities? Right? So now we're looking at our plasma and we've got plasma stuff mixing around every different direction. And we don't want that. How do we how do we beat that, chat? Any thoughts out there? What do people think? What is a way that we can get around that? What do, do we see anything in the MH370 videos that might be able to be a clue as to how to deal with these turbulence instabilities? Hmm. What about the fact that the orbs are spinning on their axis? When we're watching the orbs, we can see the heat signature, stable heat signature of an orange slice in the orbs. And we can see it spinning around. In some cases, it seems to flip. It seems to flip like this, but it also seems to spin around like this. What if the spinning is somehow able to stabilize the plasma itself? Almost like you guys ever get cotton candy at uh, the festival carnival or whatever. When they do the cotton candy, they spin it around, right? They spin it around, and then you got your cotton candy stick. Let's see if he gives us an interesting analogy right here. Uh, simulated uh, using sort of an equivalent of the Boltzmann description. So just to illustrate that uh, complex terms like this abound. There's in, you find it in fusion plasmas, you find it in astrophysical plasmas, and it's this turbulence that ends up setting the proper macroscopic properties of these media, right? So if I want to know how long it takes me to um, dissipate the to diffuse the temperature in this plasma, right? That diffusion is anomalous. It is set by the turbulence. It's not set by collisions of any means. Okay, so that that would be very very small. The fact that this is turbulent means that um, your plasma is going to cool off much quicker than otherwise. Okay? Here we go. Incidentally, you know when you drop a uh, when you put a drop of milk in your coffee, you stir it so that you mix it faster, right? You're creating turbulence because that leads to faster mixing. Similar thing here, right? If you didn't stir, it would take a long time for that one drop of milk to turn your black coffee into gray coffee, right? Um, this, so if you stir it, if you give it turbulence, it's so much faster. So same thing in a fusion device. Stir it, chat. Stir it and it gets everything to mix up faster. Holy shit. <laughs> Holy shit. I did not think we were going to learn major things in this interview with this guy. I got to be honest. I thought I was going to watch this. I thought it was going to be a normie kind of fusion thing. Now I'm learning, oh, yeah, if you want to get your electrons and your ions to kind of stabilize, simplest way to do that without getting them to go out of control, to control their motion, just start spinning it. Spin it. Centripetal motion will overcome some of the stabilities, especially if it's a weak instability. Wow. <laughs> I like this guy, chat. The reason why one of the biggest drawbacks of our hot fusion reactors is they have walls. And so if at any moment you fail to confine the plasma, just like with the sun, you see these arcs shooting out of the sun and these uh, coronal discharges coming from the sun. What happens in a fusion reactor? These coron these discharges melt the walls. But you can also get sort of the tokamak equivalent of solar flares. And these are like macroscopic um, disruptions. So here's a filament that's about to be expelled from the plasma, very much like the solar flare that you saw at the beginning. And that launches a lot of particles, very fast particles that can then hit the walls of the device and do things like this. So this blob here, that's, you know, those, those tiles have been melted by extremely fast electrons that were produced by the plasma. So this you cannot have, right? Because eventually, you know, do more of these, you will actually pierce a, wall, a hole through the wall. Right? Wow. Wow. 